And again, this is about a factor of six uh, the, between the electric version and the, and the conventional fuel version of the same airplane. Um, so why would anybody do this, right? Why would you do electric? And there's three reasons that I can think of and see in this. One is that the market may require you to do this, right? Market unlocks, where you may be regulated to where you can only, only have zero emission airplanes. Um, you, uh, the second is that there are niche, niche markets where it might make sense. Trainers, for example, where you don't really care about the performance. All you're going to do is take off and land all day and just fly around the pattern and you can recharge between a bunch of short flights. Or these high altitude, long endurance airplanes that stay up for months. Um, and maybe these urban air mobility things. And, and then the final thing is this performance through integration where what the electrification does, the electric motors does, is they allow you new freedom as a designer to sort of decouple the whole idea of the way airplanes are done today, where airplane companies build the airframe, engine companies build the engine, and they stick them together. So you have this tube and wing kind of concept, and actually integrate the, um, the electric motors into the airplane in ways where the aerodynamics and the propulsion begin to interact in ways they never did before. And that is the third part of this. That's what we're doing. That's where we think this short takeoff and landing and electric propulsion may be a combination that really makes a lot of sense. And so that's kind of part three of what I wanted to, to talk about. Um, this thing started uh, at back at MIT as a you know, I mentioned Professor Koppen, but the modern equivalent are two professors, uh, John Hansman and Mark Drela, who about five years ago said, hey, what if we took these distributed electric, this idea of having lots of small electric motors, uh, but instead of trying to use them as a helicopter thing, we used them to what's called blow the wing, to, to make the wing have a very high lift capability. Um, would that be a good idea? And they used, did a bunch of studies, and it turns out that it, it actually is a really good idea. Um, the, uh, these are some of, this, to illustrate some of the uh, lone lift airplanes that have been done in the past, uh, none of which I, were, Coppin's airplane was a traditional airplane. They had flaps and slats and stuff, but there was no interaction between the motor, the engine, and the wing. Um, and that is a, gets you data down in here, right? This is a, the angle of attack, the angle that the air hits the wing down here, and you have different flap settings um, that, uh, that, that you can set, and higher on this curve is good, right? So here's a basic airplane, and you put the flaps down, and it can get a higher um, lift coefficient. Well, this by, by combining the propulsion and the wing aerodynamics together, you can move these black curves up to these blue curves. And you can get numbers that are like five to 10 times uh, more lift off the wing than you can get off of a normal airplane. And that takes this idea of super short takeoff and landing and really amplifies it. What these, uh, these uh, high lift coefficients allow you to fly slowly. The flying slowly allows you to land in really short spaces. And that's, um, that's really the idea of what we're focused on, is being able to land in almost the same amount of space helicopters can operate on. So you could, um, you know, not the space of one helipad, but often there are multiple helipads right next to each other. So you can operate off of our, our the target design point we have is this is the hello is the helicopter port in Manhattan, the Wall Street heliport, which uh, there are three operational heliports today in Manhattan, and each of them has uh, space to accommodate multiple helicopters and enough space that if you could fit one of these super short, extreme short takeoff and landing airplanes into something about the size of a soccer field, um, you, could, you could take off and land uh, normal winged airplanes in the place today you can only land helicopters. And if you can do that 
Um, and you, there, you can operate all kinds of places, including at parts of large airports where you don't have to wait in line for the big, to use the big runways. You can get in and out of these uh, vertiports that people are proposing. Uh, you can get in and out of roads and soccer fields and the tops of parking garages and stuff like that. I mentioned that at the beginning of the talk that there's a lot of interest in this field. This is a sampling of like 20 of the probably 100 ideas that are out there of people who are trying to use electric propulsion and do these uh, urban air mobility, they're called, uh, the sort of Jetsons flying car idea, and Uber. It was really popularized by Uber a couple of years ago in a program called Uber Elevate, and the idea was Uber was going to put out um, a, a, an airborne equivalent of their, of their ground service. And so a lot of people are pursuing that. A lot of money has been poured into that. Um, and the progress is, uh, we'll see how that, how that comes out. <laughs> Our analysis is that you can always beat the vertical design with one of these short takeoff and landing designs as long as you can afford a little bit of real estate. If you can get 300 feet of space, um, you, can, you can beat these things um, with in very substantial margins. This is comparing three basic concepts that are used in these um, uh, different ideas and uh, trying to normalize them all to one weight of, of an airplane and going for a 6,000 pound airplane, how much payload could I carry if it's battery and if it's hybrid on these three different designs? And you can see that the, the, the short takeoff and landing gives you, you know, on the order of two and a half times the performance that the vertical designs are going to give. Just, that's just basically driving through the physics. And that advantage gets better the bigger you make the airplane. So it scales up nicely. These are uh, three different uh, conceptual designs, but they're tied to, to real designs that are, that are out there. And, um, and you can sort of see that, you know, they, these things, uh, in this case, being low is good. This is the weight of the whole airplane to carry uh, a given payload size. So 500 pounds is like two people, and uh, 2,000 pounds you get up to like nine people. And this is how much the airplane would have to weigh to carry that much payload for, in this case, 300 miles. And this curve is a little different depending on the exact scenarios you pick, but the trends are very similar. And that's the basis for our idea that this short takeoff and landing is economically much, uh, much better than the vertical takeoff and landing designs. And so that's kind of the basis of what we're doing today with this company um, called Electra that we started with the idea the, to be a part of the decarbonizing of, of aviation and starting by developing these urban and regional mobility solutions that can operate everywhere from Manhattan, the Wall Street heliport, to uh, really unimproved um, fields in remote areas. And we do that by a hybrid propulsion system. And think of, it's very much like in the Prius, where you have a battery and you have a, a, a fueled engine, and the battery, and in our case, it's a turbo generator, so it's a small, uh, it's actually a small jet engine, but instead of making thrust, it drives an electric generator. And uh, those two together feed a power bus that drives a bunch of electric uh, propulsors. And those, in our case, those electric motors are lined along the front of the wing, and they provide this blown lift. That ends up getting incorporated in an airplane that can seat about nine people, and uh, with an average stage length of like about 200 miles, although it can fly much further than that, um, if you, uh, if you take, uh, uh, to take some of the payload out. But the, for, the, for these missions, the 200 mile uh, range seems like a, a, good, uh, uh, a good compromise point. The fact that it's hybrid shows up in a couple of different ways. This, this is just a plot of where the energy's coming from. You have the, the turbo generator and you have the battery, 
And the turbo generator basically is turned on at the beginning and essentially runs at a flat operating point for the whole flight, maybe for the whole day. And then all of the throttle settings, the moving of the throttle, the extra power for takeoff and landing and stuff like that, that all comes out of the battery. And that has a bunch of improvements in, in maintenance costs, basically. But one of the big ones you can see is the, the yellow line is the state of charge of the battery versus the time in the flight. The gold is the e-stole, and the black line is the vertical takeoff and landing. So the VTOL designs, you're going to e exhaust the whole battery on every flight. And the, the, uh, this hybrid design, you can land with the battery fully charged, which means you can land at places that don't have big power charging stations, which is going to be a big issue for many, many users um, who want to go places where there's not a network of, of, uh, of charging stations installed. Um, 